Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Azincourt Energy Live Corporate Webinar. Azincourt Energy is a resource exploration development company focused on the alternative fuels, alternative energy sector. Azincourt trades under the symbol AAZ on the TSX Venture Exchange and AZURF on the OTCQB. Joining us today is Alex Klenman, President and CEO, and Trevor Perkins, Vice President of Exploration, who will go through the October presentation, including an update on current operations at the East Person Uranium Project, upcoming milestones, and the uranium market. At the end of the presentation, we will open it up for questions for management to address. If you are interested in asking a question and are logged into Zoom, you can submit your questions to us directly in the chat module. Please note, this webinar is being recorded today, Thursday, October 21st, and will soon be made available on the company's website. Lastly, RBMG is not a registered investment advisor or broker dealer. For more information, please visit rbmilestone.com. It is now our pleasure to introduce you to Alex Klenman of Azincourt. Alex. Uh, thank you, Paul, and thanks to those in attendance and to anybody who will be doing this um, afterwards. Um, we're going to proceed, and some of you may be familiar with us, but some of you may not. So we're going to assume you may not be. So um, we're going to give you a full background here. We're a uranium exploration and development company. As uh, Paul mentioned, we trade on the TSX Venture and we trade on the OTCQB. Uh, we are fully DTC eligible now, so uh, we're fully tradable uh, south of the border, which is good for us. Um, we're going to go through our slides here. We're going to the emphasis is going to be on the East Preston Uranium Project, which is which is our uh, main focus and our flagship, and uh, we'll get to that momentarily. Uh, standard disclaimer, most of you have seen these. Uh, they deal with forward-looking statements and things like that. Uh, the most important thing here is to note at the bottom of this slide that um, all of the technical information has been vetted and approved by uh, Trevor uh, Perkins, our Vice President of Exploration and GR, qualified person uh, under the, uh, as defined by National Instrument 4301 standards. So very important that people understand that. Um, so we're, we're here because we've seen and we've recognized uh, a need. And, and anybody in this space knows that need. A number of, of, of reactors and, and the reliance on nuclear power is growing. And to feed that, you need the fuel. And the fuel comes from uranium. And that's what we do. We're in the, in the, in the business of finding and defining a deposit that uh, can, can help on the supply end. Because there's definitely a supply demand fundamental at work. Um, where there, there's going to be supply issues. There already is, but there's going to be as, as there are more built and more reactors coming online. So uh, nice to see these types of graphics sort of come true. Here we are in 2021. We're starting to see some of this actually happen, which is, which is important. Um, a bit about management. I'm the president and CEO uh, of Azincourt. I got involved in the summer of, July, uh, summer of 2017 in July to be exact. I was a shareholder of the company. I knew the chairman of Azincourt uh, at that time, a man named Ian Stalker, and, and Ian wanted some help on the management side. So I came in. Um, I love the space. I was involved at, peripherally in, in 2011 and uh, saw what could happen in a uranium bowl and, and really wanted to be involved with quality junior, quality explorer, and, and got that, got the job and, and haven't left and it's been a, it's been a, it's been a ride. Um, we brought Trevor on last year. I needed a, uh, somebody to handle the exploration and the, and the drilling, uh, and Trevor came highly recommended. We needed somebody who had uh, exploration success, discovery success in the basin and elsewhere in the uranium space, and brings that to the table. So a very capable guy leading our drill programs and our exploration efforts, and someone who has notches on his belt uh, in a successful way, and that's important. Uh, the remainder uh, of the management team includes two directors, uh, Ted O'Connor and Paul Reynolds, um, both quality individuals. Ted uh, spent 20 years with Cameco in, in um, senior positions in the basin, it was also the former CEO of Plateau Energy Metals in Peru, which was bought out recently by American Lithium. Uh, Paul is a generalist uh, um, geologist uh, with, with 
a strong skill set across many disciplines. So we're happy to have him and Vivian, our CFO, does a great job of making sure we're compliant and getting everything filed in time. Um, again, the industry overview, why are we in this space? We're, we're here because there are more reactors in the pipeline. Um, right now, there's, you know, across the planet, the reliance on nuclear energy is getting, getting bigger and stronger and more prominent. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that it does qualify as a clean energy uh, initiative. And, and one thing, I mean, you get the odd, uh, you've had the odd black swan events and they've been pretty catastrophic if you look at you know, Three Mile Island and Chernobyl, Fukushima. But the thing that we can point out here that, that's positive is the reactor design is getting better. They're getting smaller, they're getting self-contained um, and that the, the possibilities of such black swans are getting reduced through technology. And, um, you know, we see this as, 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 as positive and so do others. And there's reliance, we know, uh, on nuclear. And, and I guess the, the main thing here to, to note is the U.S. utilities, the nuclear power uh, facilities in the U.S. are the biggest buyers on the planet of, of the raw material. And, and there's, they typically buy in what they call 10-year uh, contracts. And, and a lot of those contracts that expired are expiring or about to expire. And a lot of these U.S. reactors, these U.S. utilities need to buy product. They need to start inking these long-term deals. They haven't yet to do it. And, and we, we see that in this space as being a critical catalyst to, to spot moving. And we've already seen the beginning of that. Um, we're at, you know, eight, nine, ten-year highs. That's uh, a good sign for those of us that have fought our way through the bear market. Um, as mentioned, we have two sets of projects. Number one is the, the East Preston project in located in, in the Athabasca Basin, the Western Athabasca, Saskatchewan. Um, we're, I guess if you look at this first uh, bullet point, that's a, that's a sense of uh, issue of pride for us. Uh, we were able to earn the uh, uh, majority interest in this project uh, when you know people weren't answering phone calls from uranium explorers. And, we were able to raise money, albeit cheaply, but we did it. We got through this uh, bull, or this bear market, poised to, I guess, exploit the bull uh, by having earned that uh, majority. So we've done that. Uh, the project itself is over 25,000 hectares in Western Athabasca, a premier uh, location for finding uranium deposits. So it's got size, it's got scalability. Uh, we have a huge target inventory on the project. Drilling, you know, 150 holes here in the next couple of years. Uh, we've got that many targets to drill, and uh, we're located in a great neighborhood. There's literally 10 billion or more in market cap surrounding us. In particular, two companies, Rano, uh, the big French company, and, and NextGen. Uh, so those are billion dollar market caps uh, just bordering us. Uh, so great neighborhood, uh, big size property in the right place, and we control uh, majority interest of it. We're actually over 70 percent. Uh, we also have a small oops, small group of projects in the in Puno, Peru. Um, they're both prospective for uranium and lithium. Um, it's not a huge priority for us. Uh, they're good projects. We own them 100%. Uh, we'll speak to them momentarily, but uh, our focus at the moment is definitely 100% on these Preston. Um, here's a, a slide to illustrate just where the Athabasca Basin is for people who are unfamiliar with it. That's northern Saskatchewan here in Canada. The basin is quite large. Um, and it's known uh, across the planet as, as a world-class uranium district. Uh, the largest, highest-grade uranium deposits in the world are, are found there. Uh, production uh, history goes back 40-plus years, and obviously Canada is a state of mining economy. Um, and we're here in the western Athabasca, which is important, um, and we'll tell you why. Um, here's our neighborhood in the western Athabasca. And what, what's attractive about um, the western Athabasca is we don't have the overburden uh, and sandstone cover that you have to drill through to get, get to uranium deposits. Um, typically, you're looking at several hundred meters, 800 meters or more, uh, just to get there. Um, we're drilling 100 to 200, 250 meters in where we are. So shallower deposits uh, means less money spent on drilling and easier for a micro cap or a small cap to operate in. But here's a look at our neighborhood and some of the market caps as of October 7th, anyway, in, in the neighborhood. Obviously, there's a Rano. And the Sky Harbor JV next door. We're Preston. We're East Preston. That's Preston. Next Gen is on the north of us. You can see other companies in the mix: uh, Cameco, Denison, uh, UEX, Fission. They're all in the neighborhood. Um, so, a great, 
great place to be. And we're one of the smallest market caps in the neighborhood. Um, so for us today, if this land package were available, um, we probably couldn't afford it. So it's kind of nice to see uh, that, the, that the area is growing, interest is growing, and, and, and we made the right decision years ago when we entered the uh, earn in agreement with the Sky Harbor. A uh, quick peek again, drill, drilling down a little closer on the East Preston project. Um, over 3 million, actually close, closer to 4 million has been spent in the past three years, getting us to this point where we have such a robust target inventory. Didn't happen overnight. It took years of, of, of uh, surveys and a little bit of drilling to get to the point where we can confidently say we have you know over 30 kilometers of conductive trend uh, with multiple target zones. And um, that's important. So a lot of the new companies on the block who come in and say, we're, we're in the neighborhood and we have, we're, we're close to this company and close to that company. But it takes time and effort and money to get legitimate drill targets in your pocket. And, and we've done that. So um, that's a good thing for us. And, and it maybe sets us apart from some of the other explorers uh, in the area, especially the newer companies. Um, I'm going to hand over the technical slides now to our VP Exploration, Trevor Perkins. Uh, he's going to explain a little bit more technically why we love the project and how the targets work and, and what we're, we're attempting to do with our drill programs. So go ahead, Trevor. Let me know when you want to change slides. Thank you, Alex. So as Alex mentioned, uh, the East Preston project has been... Uh, hey, Trevor, sorry to interrupt. You might want to get closer to your mic. You sound a little muffled. <laughs> okay, sorry. All right. So Thank as, you. Alex, uh, as Alex has mentioned, uh, we've been uh, involved in the East Preston project since 2017. However, the project itself has been being worked by the previous owners of the project since about 2014. So some of the work I will be talking about has been completed by the previous operators, uh, but we have the data and we're making use of the data to help with our targeting. So uh, this first slide here, as you can see, uh, when the project was initially covered by an airborne electromagnetic survey, looking for areas of conductivity on the property uh, to begin our focus in on the areas we wanted to work. And the reason we look for these areas of conductivity is that uh, unconformity uranium deposits in the Athabasca Basin typically are uh, related to and associated closely to basement conductive packages. That's a, a conductive unit, typically graphite in the bay, in the Athabasca, but it, we have some sulfides and base metal mineralization that could occur there as well. But these conductive packages are what we want to focus in on because that seems to be where the uh, uranium seems to uh, be deposited. So that is our first criteria that we want to look for if we need to be in a conductive corridor. So these airborne surveys will help us find these corridors. So as you can see, we have two main corridors through the central portion of the property. Uh, our AG trend, which is uh, identified as A on the figure below, as well as our KHQ trend, which is B and C on the figure. And to the west of these, you can also see many smaller parallel trends that uh, have not been tested yet as well. And to the east, we can see some, some more oval bullseye shaped targets along weaker trends that also will require attention at some point. So our first pass with the EM surveys, it very easily identifies that we have some really nice conductive corridors on the property. Uh, next slide, please, Alex. So this slide, the map shows a similar diagram as the previous slide uh, with the same data set with the, with the colors changed a bit to really emphasize where the conductive corridors uh, occurred on the province, on the property, sorry. You can see the, uh, through the center portion of the property, our AG trend is the main one we're following. It shows up very well. We then ran ground-based surveys over this conductive corridor because we need to know exactly where within that conductive corridor the actual rock, conductive rock package exists. Because the corridor can be quite broad in the airborne survey. So we need to narrow that down for drilling purposes. Otherwise we could be drilling forever trying to find it. So the ground-based electromagnetic survey, in this case, we used a horizontal loop 
configuration survey. Uh, typically, this survey typically looks in the upper 100 to 200 meters of rock. So we're still, we're looking for things quite shallow. And on this uh, diagram, you can see a, a squiggly line through the, the profile. Uh, the straight lines show where our grid was, ground grids were run, and you can see a squiggly line crossing this grid. That's the actual conductor identified. And, uh, and then we also ran a gravity survey on this conductor. Uh, so next slide, please, Alex. So this diagram shows, still shows the wavy lines for the conductor, still shows the grids in the background, but now we're seeing shading in the background on these grids, uh, identifying our gravity data. So we were looking for gravity lows, which are the darker colors, the blues and purples on this map. We wanted to focus in on structure as well. The gravity lows indicate areas of low density rocks. Typically, these rocks are of a lower density because they've been broken up. They're not a nice, competent rock. Uh, there's been a lot of structure go through and really break things up and crack it up. Now, we want to see where these structures and the conductors coincide, because then that tells you you've got your structure with a graphitic package right next to it you're getting all of, the, uh, all of the features you want to see to encourage uranium deposition. So we can see here, we've got our conductor, we've got our structure. We've got two of the big criteria right there to help us find uranium. Next, and you can see also, we've got several other, uh, other um, targets where we've run individual lines over smaller conductors that were identified. And uh, these are all telling us we've got multiple targets. There's, there's a lot of targets on this property, no shortage of targets. We'll be here for a while testing them all. Next slide, Alex. So now that we've run our geophysics, the thing left to do, still the best way to find the uranium deposit is to actually drill it. Because the geophysics just gets you in the ballpark. It tells you where you probably want to be. The truth is in the drilling. So to date, we've drilled 17 holes on the property. Property. These have dominantly been focused on our AG trend and even more so focused at the north end of the AG trend in our A zones and our AB zone. And drilling to date has totaled about just under 4,200 meters. And this is not a lot of drilling in terms of finding a uranium deposit, but it's helping us narrow down where we want to be. These holes have so far identified, we've got the right geology, we've got a graphitic conductive package within our rock types, we've got multiple phases of structuring associated with these rock types and with the conductive package in the area as well. Now on this slide in the figure, you can see red lines with halos around them. Those are identifying where the conductors have actually been uh, I, uh, interpreted to exist based on the geophysics. And you can see these lines have a lot of bends and breaks in them as well. Those bends and breaks typically indicate that we probably have a cross structure coming through. The dominant uh, structure with our graphitic package is trending to the northeast, but we're seeing breaks that would indicate we have east-west and probably northwest trending structures coming through. And these cross structures can be fairly important because they increase ground preparation. They increase the potential for a nice broken up area where fluids that are containing the uranium and other base metals can sit, pool, deposit out their uranium. And uh, most of the deposits that are, have been found in the basin typically occur where these structures intersect. So where you've got your main structure being intersected by a cross structure, it just seems to focus everything into that area. And so that's your, one of your primary targets to look for. And there's no shortage for us to look for here. And we're seeing, we're seeing elevated base metals already. We're seeing good alteration. So we know we've got the right fluids in the area. Now we just have to find the place where that uranium is actually dropping out of solution and, and forming a deposit. Next slide, Alex. So this year, in the winter, we decided to come in and run a 10 to 12 hole program 
we wanted to have a really good look at the AG trend and say, where do we want to be on this trend? So we've started testing bends in the conductors, breaks in the conductors associated with our gravity lows saying, you know, let's test all these targets. So we have to systematically go along and test the targets and decide if it's a target worth following up or if we want to move on to the next one. So what we're seeing in, in this winter program, we ended up only drilling five holes because warm weather forced us to shut down early. But these five holes gave us a lot of information. We're seeing our structures. We're seeing our right lithologies like we expected to see. And they're telling us we're in the right area. We're seeing elevated base metals. And better now, better yet, we're even seeing elevated uranium now, especially in the southern three holes that we drilled the last three holes of the winter program. We've seen elevated uranium in these holes. It seems to be increasing to the south. Alteration seems to be improving to the south. Tells us we're moving in the right direction. We're on, the, on track to hopefully find something. Everything is improving. Everything is telling us what we're doing is, is uh, we're doing the right thing. So Perfect. next slide, Alex. So we came back in this summer, we decided well, in the summer, we had radio, uh, airborne radiometric survey over the northern portion of the property. We decided to drill, uh, to run an airborne sur radiometric survey over the southern portion of the property, just to give us another tool in our toolbox to say, you know, we're picking our best targets. This survey typically looks at very near surface stuff, like we're talking probably in the top foot of what, uh, of the ground of what you're seeing with the radiometric survey. So we're typically looking for exposed outcrops that may be uh, radioactive or exposed boulders that may be radioactive. And where you're seeing red and purple on this uh, map is where we typically have what we call a radiometric anomaly. So it could be one of these things. We then went in on the ground in August to check some of these areas. We focused mainly on the Southern G zone and our Southern H and our Q zones because those were the areas we were planning on drilling this winter. We definitely have more anomalies further east we'll look at, but we'll wait until we're getting closer to drilling those areas before we go in and try and ground truth those anomalies. But what we're seeing on the ground, we're seeing outcrops, we're seeing various boulders. Um, it's telling us we are potentially on the right track. And why we want to key in on boulders, if those boulders are radiometric or are radioactive, they can lead us to a deposit that may be buried. Um, the boulders, the glaciers typically rip up boulders off the top of the deposit and move them down ice. So if we follow those up, up uh, opposite the direction the ice came from, we can potentially find a deposit up ice. So, so we, want to, we want to key in on those if we find them. Next slide, please, Alex. So our plans moving forward for this winter, we're coming in with a big drill program. We want to make up for the meterage we lost this winter, this past winter. Plus, we want to be able to answer a lot of questions, make sure we're on the right track, and ideally, you know, find a deposit or find a showing at least that tells us we're in the vicinity of a deposit. So our idea is to get in here drill 30 to 35 holes, which as I previously stated, we've only drilled 17 on the property so far. So this is gonna be a huge amount of data that we don't previously have that's gonna, that's gonna answer a lot of questions and, and uh, show us that our, our methods are working. So we're gonna focus on our G zone and uh, move on to the H and Q zone as results warrant. Our plan is to come in in December, start building our road into the area, build our camp, and then uh, be drilling in early to mid-January. We're going to have two drills on the property. We expect the program to run two and a half to three months, and we're expecting that this program is going to cost us around $2.3 million, which at this time we are fully funded to undertake this work. And thank you, Alex. Perfect. You. Thank you, uh, Trevor. Um, I'm going to move on. We'll speak more to East Preston momentarily, but I'm going to go through the Peruvian slides just uh, briefly so people get an idea of what's going on down there. Um, we, we have a three-project 
group called the Escalera Group. Um, there, it's located on the Picotani Plateau. Um, this plateau is uh, geologically unique in a lot of ways. Um, you've got everything from base metals to uh, uranium and lithium and, and precious metals, gold and silver. Uh, so it, volcanic activity uh, in, in going back you know, millions of years has, has created a really unique um, uh, geological setting that you're getting these incredible amounts of different types of, of minerals and, and, and materials. Um, we're here, at the, the other two projects, Condorlet and Lithuania are not really huge priorities for us. Escalera seems to be the one that we like. Most, it has the most data, and I'll show you that in a moment. Up here, this big uh, sort of turquoise, blue, purple blotch is uh, what was formerly the Plateau Energy Metals uh, deposit. It's now American Lithium. Uh, so that's uranium and lithium up here. Um, you're getting lots of big companies like Minsur and Rio Tinto with, with claims in the area and a lot of uh, stuff going on on the plateau. So really good place uh, in terms of if you're going to be looking for something, you look in an area like this. Um, we did uh, some work on our property in 2018. We did a, we did a prospecting program. Uh, we came back with some really nice uh, numbers and some of the rock samples. You can see those here. Um, we were able to delineate about 6.5 kilometers with the trend. Um, and that was a really good start, a really good beginning to a, to a rock program. Um, and then you'll see here, uh, that's the trend of most interest, uh, four and a half kilometers across the northern section of the property, a smaller trend down here uh, with good numbers, very solid numbers. And then there's some lithium and rock uh, that warrants further uh, exploration uh, down here as well. So as mentioned, it's not a huge um, priority for us. Um, our, met, our, our modeling for the uh, deposition here is much like the Makusani uranium deposit, which is uh, now American lithium um, up the road from us. But, but that's what this frothy volcanic um, activity uh, can generate. So we have the right rocks. We have the right look. It needs more work. We'd like to get down and do some more work there. Uh, COVID has, has interrupted any further development since uh, we got in, in, in pick up the projects, but we were able to buy them out 100%, so we own them. So we can work them, we can sell them, we can develop them. Uh, we're not quite sure which direction we're gonna go in the short term. Uh, long term, we have plans, but right now our plans are at um, East Preston. Uh, our cap structure, uh, you'll notice a lot of retail investors notice things like this, uh, 434 million shares out. I can tell you this, in our, in our space, in our peer group, that's not astronomical, um, particularly if you look at some of the Australian experts. Um, but we are, um, uh, this is, I guess, the byproduct of having to uh, finance through this bear market that we've come through. Nobody expected it to last 10 years. I mean, uh, in 2007, spot ran to 120. 2011, it ran up to 70 or so. And uh, there was only a two, three year gap between those runs. And from 2011 to 2021, that's 10 years. We haven't had the gap. So most of the companies that have been around and established in the space have financed it at more depressed levels than is ideal. And you'll see some more bloated share structures because of that. Um, but I do uh, tell any uh, retail investor who has concerns about share structure to look at the institutional support that Azincourt uh, enjoys. Um, currently, our, our, our treasury is up around $12 million. Um, and 40% and of the company is owned by institutional funds. Um, and that is a very rare thing for a company that has yet to make the big discovery hole. And we're close, and they recognize that. That's one of the reasons why we were able to attract financing. Uh, we raised $8.1 million so far uh, in the last few months. This year, I think we've raised north of $12. Um, more, you know, more, actually, I think. But... But all of that's coming from institutional funds. Now, why would an institutional fund typically take an interest in a, in a, uh, a pre-discovery explorer, which is the highest risk um, dynamic you have in the markets? Uh, it's because it, the sector itself is, is validated as, as, as being a place to put money, especially ahead of what we think is going to be a generational bull. Um, but also that validates the project itself and the quality of the exploration project and the ability to say, hey, these guys can make discovery. There's no other way to, to, to categorize that level of interest uh, from funds. Um, so we're, we're pleased, we're grateful that the funds have taken an interest in us and that have funded us to the point where we can drill 
significant amount of holes over the next couple of years. Insiders, close associates, family, and friends on about 20%. That has since been diluted out since the last financing. We obviously can't write checks to pay some of the funds, but we're, we're all invested and uh, we'll continue to be invested in our, in our company. So the good thing to note here is that the level of institutional support is really high for a pre-discovery drill company. Uh, and we have a $12 million treasury, again, very high for pre-discovery drilling. Uh, if anybody has been around as a port for years, you know, like towards the end of 2019, we had a two cent bid and less than $200,000 in the bank. And, uh, you know, uh, there was a priest standing next to the bed, uh, ready to read the last rites. But we, we avoided that and uh, we're happy we did. We've earned our, our control of East Preston, again, over 70% as, as it sits today. Uh, and we're well funded and ready to drill. So we'll leave it at that. And uh, we'll take some questions if you have any. We're happy to answer uh, that. And um, um, I'll stop sharing the screen and we can just go to uh, our lovely faces. So, Paul, over to you. Yep. Uh, thank you. Once again, if you are interested in asking a question and are logged into Zoom, uh, please submit your questions to us directly in the QA um, and the chat. Uh, we're going to get right to it. Uh, can you speak uh, to the cash burn rate expected uh, versus previous years? Yeah, obviously, I think the burn rate's going to go up. Um, there's two ways I look at a burn rate. Number one, exploration costs. And number two, marketing and GNA. So um, number one, we know we're going to spend more money on exploration. That's the whole point of this exercise. Um, as Trevor mentioned, you know, 2.3 million for a drill program is pretty good. Um, so that's number one. Um, but we're also going to ramp up marketing. We've waited for 10 years to have an audience, and now we have an audience and it's growing. So we're going to spend some money over the next six months in and around this drill program to improve our brand awareness, uh, get a bigger audience, and try to capture some market share because there's a lot more uranium companies out there than there were you know, a year or two ago. Um, a lot of you know, people chase momentum and they're here. So um, we need to make sure we're seen and that the, the, the project is, is marketed and uh, so we'll, we'll probably increase our burn. Uh, it's somewhere in the 50,000, uh, 60,000 a month Canadian right now. Um, if you add marketing to that, it'll increase over the next four to six months. But certainly uh, with a treasury of 12 million, we can put, spend more money and, and still have plenty left to drill and, and continue working for several years. Right, and they're all also asking, can you speak to any additional option and agreements you may have on your radar? That's a good question. Um, you know, um, we're really pleased with East Preston and there's no need for us to go look for something else. Uh, having said that, um, we're looking, we're always looking. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of uranium projects floating around right now and being offered for sale and everybody's doing business. So if we can find something that we can add to our portfolio and, and increase the value of the company, we would look at that. Um, we don't need to do that. And part of my concern about making a move maybe in that direction is that we send a message to the market that we don't like these Preston. That's not the case. So if anybody sees us uh, make an acquisition in the next three or six months, um, it has nothing to do with the prospectivity of East Preston, uh, none whatsoever. That, that project is as good as it gets in the exploration space and we've got a long way to go uh, before we determine anything really, unless we hit a hole tomorrow. Then exchange but but it's nice if we can if we can put some tonnage or an add add another project into our portfolio that's going to increase value and give us uh, multiple cars in the driveway as i like to say then uh, yeah we'll look at that is there any interest uh in a buyer from another company not yet um but i'll tell you what's important um first of all uh, location size and scalability so we have a big enough project to get a major's attention and we just happen to have two billion dollar market caps bordering us. So, uh, and one of them uh, we share a, a joint venture partner with. So, Orano is a JV partner with Sky Harbor, and Sky Harbor is our JV partner on East Preston. We have a great relationship with Sky Harbor. So, it isn't a stretch to anybody's imagination to to uh, project ahead. In, and if, if 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 things go well, and we we're able to make discovery, and we're able to delineate something of size and, and value that a discussion, us to get to Orano wouldn't be a difficult uh, bridge to cross um, through, through our friends at Sky Harbor. And uh, you know that's the main thing. So yes, um, we'd like to see that, but we're not at the point yet where anybody's gonna come knocking. 
that'll happen after we make our discovery and are able to delineate something of size in. Thank you. Um, can you talk about your experience so far with AI and are there any benefits there? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Trevor Trevor and I have had discussions about this. So what we did with Phoebe, a good, real good partner, solid partner to have. Uh, I think they're innovators and, and they're bringing a lot of value. But what I liked about making that partnership, it's a toe dip for us in terms of cash. Um, and look, Part of what we do in exploration is burn through money. We burn through money because we drill holes. And, and if we drill too many holes, we're, we're, you know, we're, if we can tighten up efficiency in that regard, uh, we're going to save money and we're going to be more efficient in the application of, of funds, capital, in the exploration side of things. AI can do that. Um, not only that, but if we're able to put less holes down, we're also making less of an environmental impact. Which I think is important. If we're a green energy, clean energy company, and we're not cognizant of something like that, then uh, we're remiss. So we have to be, you know, focused on things like that. So when we put that news out, I got a couple of calls from investors saying, "Well, that sounds gimmicky," and then I had to direct their attention to a company out of Silicon Valley called Cobalt Metals, K O B O L D Metals, uh, CobaltMetals.com. Go check them out. A privately funded company, a lot of Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley money in it and uh, including Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and people like that. Um, but it's an AI-driven exploration company. They're set up to look for battery metals, energy metals, like copper and lithium, and nickel and things like that. Um, and, but you know, it's, there's, I think there's 12 PhDs uh, running that company. So it's an interesting um, uh, move forward. And, 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 and I think if, if we're not embracing technology or at least testing it out, we're, we're not doing our job. Um, you know, I mean, a few years ago, you couldn't fly a LIDAR survey. Now we have LIDAR surveys, um, and, and, you know, certain ways to help us pinpoint areas to drill and perhaps find a deposit. Uh, if AI can do that, it, it, it looks like something we'd like to toe dip in and, and get used to doing. Um, in this case, it's a data situation. So we give, uh, we give the, we put all of the data in a, in, a, in a bucket, if you will, and we let the AI crawl that bucket. And what we're looking for is patterns potentially and, 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 and consistencies in positive exploration and successful exploration. And, and, and it's not that we don't know and people like Trevor don't know what they're looking for. They do 100%. But the more data you have, the greater ability to look from above down. Um, you know, eventually our goal is to utilize AI to help us put less holes down, spend less money in exploratory drilling, less misses, better efficiency, greater, greater success rate. And, and you know, we, we benefit from that and, and the environmental impact benefits from that. So that's really our goal with AI. And, and it's just in the early days for us right now. And it's going to be developed as we move along. We have a one-year contract with Phoebe and uh, it's just beginning now. So hopefully uh, in the course of the next 12 months, we'll see uh, AI contribute positively to what we're yeah, that was, a, that was a good question. Thank you for that. Are we expecting an update on expanded drill targets in the two main zones? Trevor, I'll let you answer that. I mean, we will, once we've uh, finalized the drill plan and the contractors, we will be putting out a release with more information on the drilling program itself, for sure. Yeah. And what are your future plans for drilling, given the lack of uranium traces in your previous holes? Uh, that's a question. That's uh, let me let me let me start that. That's, one. that's a fun question. <laughs> yeah. So so you know, um, first of all, there's video on our site and elsewhere of of of, of uh, drone flyovers. On um, we put it on our Twitter feed and things like that, um, where you can see the size and scope of of East Preston. So it's massive in terms of of of, of, of a, uh, in terms of a land position. Got a lot of area to cover. We've only scratched the surface with 17 holes. Um, Trevor can speak to the MacArthur uh, River, for example. I think that was the 200th hole or something like that that hit. Now we don't expect that to be the case here. Technology is better, um, but but uranium is 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 a difficult beast to find. Um, we we're looking for graphite, which causes the uranium to drop as the fluids pass through, but they may not drop it in a particular area that that's. You know, inundated with graphite, they may pick another area with 
graphite that's that's going to be the place where the uranium drops. So we're going to continue to look, and, and it may take some time, but we're certainly funded to do that. I mean, we're going to do 30 to 35 holes for 2.3 million this year. We've got 12 million in the bank. So do the math. Uh, we could be do, we could do a lot of drill holes with what we have in the bank. Um, there's no concern whatsoever for us on the 17 holes to date. In fact, each round of drilling has given us more data and been more suggestive that we are, as Trevor says, on the right track and vectoring towards discovery. If those holes didn't give us uh, the, the base metal runs, the, the rare earth element runs, the, the, all of the things that we're seeing in these holes, the graphitic packages and the things that we're drilling through, then, then maybe we'd be concerned, but we're not. Everything, and, and you know, the last three holes we drilled actually started to give us elevated uranium levels for the first time. So obviously we're, we're headed in the right direction and the funds that, that, that are backing us believe the same thing we do, that it's just a matter of time. Now, um, I don't know one exploration company that doesn't think they're gonna make discoveries. So we're not unique in that sense, but we are getting the data we need in those first few holes, to keep us on, on the hunt and, and in a positive way. Trevor, if you need to add to that, go right ahead. Oh, the, basic, the biggest thing to add is every single hole gives you information that helps you improve your targeting for the next hole. So the lack of results in a hole is a little bit misleading because every hole gives you results. It just may not be uranium, but it's helping you find uranium. Yes, and, and mineralization is the goal, obviously. Um, and it'll come. I mean, it, I don't think there's any uranium exploration, successful uranium exploration story that didn't do what we're doing. So mm -hmm. all of the holes that we've drilled are giving us that information. It's no different for anybody else. Very rarely, someone steps up to the plate and hits a home run in their first at bat. It happens. But, but honestly, you, you might have to slug through the minors for a couple of years before you get the big hit. And, and, and we're doing it. We're only 17 holes in. Uh, we now have control of the project. Another thing to think about, if we put a hole out a year or two ago, we may not have had an audience for it. Right now, we have an audience for a hole. So I like that. And if you'd asked me uh, a year ago if I'd like exploration success, I'd like a discovery hole, uh, sure, I'd probably take it. But if I could pick the time to do it, it wouldn't have been then. It's going to be now or in the, in the near future. That's the optimal time to deliver a discovery to the market. Thanks, guys. Now, we received this question prior to this webinar, um, and it, it would be a good question to ask and uh, to answer for those new to as in court or those who are not really entirely sure here. But um, can you talk about the production of other minerals? Hmm. Yeah, it wouldn't apply to what we're doing. Uh, production of uranium is something we can speak to. Obviously, there's been cuts in production for various reasons, uh, COVID. Um, depressed price, spot price. A lot of the mines aren't profitable. You know, uh, south of fifty bucks a pound. So we're, uh, you know, we're in that neighborhood right now. But even if a couple of them turn on tomorrow, there's, there's a gap between mining and having product to sell. Uh, so there's still supply issues, um, and and so we can speak to that. But in terms of other minerals, uh, no, uh, we're a uranium uh, exploration company. We're looking for uranium, and that's that's really all that applies here. Although we do have a, a, a sniff of rare, rare earth elements on the property as well. Yeah, and we did, and we did receive a question on uh, production delays. So if, if there is anything that you would like to add to that, uh, which you just answered, uh, you know, let yeah, us Trevor, know. if you have anything to add, go right ahead. If not, I think not that's a good point on that. Uh, another interesting question, then, unless uh, any of our other attendees have um, a question here, uh, this would be our last question. Um, and um, we have asked this question before. It's, it's pretty important, but um, what is the relative balance of Canadian and Peruvian activities going forward, especially considering recent South American nationalism sentiment? Yeah, no, good Easy to answer, 100% East Preston, 0% Peru. That's today. Um, we're not going down there anytime soon. If anything, we'll get there maybe in the summer of 2022 with a small program. Majority of the funds that we have in, in the bank, uh, it, it's a mandate from the institutional investors to, to develop East Preston. So we're gonna do that. It really is our best prospect and we're really close. So the money's gonna go into East Preston. That's great, thank you. 
And um, thanks everyone for joining today's webinar uh, that will soon be made available on the Asin Court website. If you have any additional questions that have not been addressed on this webinar, please feel free to email us at asincourt at rbmilestone.com. Again, that's asincourt at rbmilestone.com. Thanks again. You are now free to disconnect. Thanks, guys. Thank you, everyone. Take care.